here because, uh, like most of you, uh, I believe in the future because that's where I'm going to spend the rest of my life. I don't know who said that, but it's one of the great comments, and it's patently true. Uh, and I believe the future is going to be profoundly different than the present that we're living in. And I believe these technologies that we're talking about here, that Peter's talking about, that Ray's talking about, that all the guests here are talking about, are going to change the world, change us as human beings, and I want to try to understand that. In 1969, I was 13 years old, I joined the Science Fiction Book Club, and I got my first book, it was called The Science Fiction Hall of Fame. The Science Fiction Writers of America had voted on the greatest science fiction stories of all time. I got it, it was uh, initially one volume, then two volumes, became several volumes, but the first story I read was called Helen O'Loy, and it was a story written in 1942 about a man who fell in love with a robot, and the robot falling in love with the man. 1942. This was such a beautifully written story, and it, it involved death and the demise of one of the characters. I won't tell you which one, but I was so profoundly moved as a 13 years old, this was the summer of landing on the moon, that I became a science fiction fan, and unwittingly, I didn't know this word, I became a futurist and began avidly reading science fiction. And eventually, in the 1980s, when I became more aware of machine technology, and particularly when I started uh, reading Ray Kurzweil's books, I too became involved in the singularity and trying to understand it and where it's going. I want to talk to you a little bit about my particular field, which is finance. I'm the stocks correspondent for CNBC. I've been with CNBC 27 years, very proud of that. It's very difficult to make a living in the financial journalism community. In fact, journalism in general is a tough business, but I've toughed it out. I've been the stocks correspondent for CNBC at the New York Stock Exchange for the last 20 years, so I've covered all of the big stock movements, uh, the Russian debt default, uh, the Thai bot crisis, the 2008 financial crisis, 9-11, and a lot of other things. So I just want to bring you up today on the intersection between what we're talking about today, which is the intersection between Wall Street finances uh, and, uh, and, and technology. So let's see if we can chat a little bit about what's going on here. We talked last year about what's driving fintech. And the primary thing when I talk to banks, which are the people I talk to, is maintaining control of the customer relationship and making the experience as smooth and effortless as possible. They're involved in cost cutting because there is a low growth world out there and that's the way to get it. And AI and fintech is the way to get at the cost cutting uh, and low profitability issues that are out there. We're in very early stages of, of the disruption around fintech. People think, oh, I've got an app so I can get onto my bank account. That's just the beginning. We're not even close to where we could really be. We're just starting the convenience stage of this thing. So look, look here, in 2015 there was only 1% of North American consumer banking revenue that had migrated to a, a digital platform. It might go up to 2020 uh, to 10%, 17%. This is still pretty slow. I think this will accelerate pretty quickly because most of these technologies you find, when you start getting in the mid-teens, you hit a tipping point. This happened with uh, CD sales, for example, uh, streaming. Uh, a lot of these technologies in the mid-teens, it just accelerates very quickly. And by the way, uh, a lot of this data, I'm very indebted to Citigroup, which uh, uh, did some early research. It put out a very good research report. I'm using some of their numbers uh, throughout this. Uh, business to consumer versus business to business is very interesting because we've heard a lot about the business to consumer model here. We know about Airbnb, we know about PayPal, we know about Uber. Those are the big success stories that are out there. Business to cons the, the business to business is a little more difficult here uh, because uh, it just involves much more difficult relationships. But we are seeing some successes out there. I don't know if you've been following Ripple, which is a uh, payments infrastructure company that is tangentially uh, involved um, in, in some of the digital currency issues. Uh, they have been in the news recently. Uh, that's a success story. Uh, we had Blythe Masters on a couple of years ago talking about uh, the blockchain and digital asset holdings. And we're starting to see a lot of tax and accounting tools uh, uh, emerge right now here. We've also, um, I'm the stocks correspondent, I'd be remiss if I didn't, at least didn't mention the stock market here, we've seen big gains in electronic payment providers in the last year. Uh, we talked about some of the difficulties these payment providers have been having, that they're not immune from the laws of gravity. Lending Tree had a big problem uh, a year and a half ago, but you can see uh, people are eager to buy into these companies. Right now here, we're talking about 8% growth in electronic payment volumes over the next two years. That's pretty good. Um, the question is, can you keep it up here? Uh, one of the things I have been emphasizing is look at China versus the United States. There are very big differences because China is leapfrogging technology. 
Just like in Africa, there were many countries where they never even put any landlines in the ground. They didn't have them. They just simply went right to wireless technology. To a certain extent, this is happening in China. The big difference is in the United States, fintech companies tend to be single issue companies by and large. They're, you're a lending company, you're a payment company, you're a wealth management app or something like that. China never had any of that. China's companies, for the most part, were originally built, the bigger ones, around one-stop shopping shopping, completely one-stop shopping. I'll show you some uh, amazing statistics. The reason this happened is because suddenly they got a middle-class explosion that came out of literally nowhere. So and we're defining middle class as 9,000 to 6,000, which is sort of the numbers people use when they talk about the middle class in China a year. 2002, the people who made that amount of money were 7% of the population. Ten years later, 54% of the population was middle class. Think about that. 50% of the country became middle class in a 10-year period. Do you know what that does? It would enable them to leapfrog the technology here. So here you have mobile internet users in 2007 was a quarter of the population. Now it's 90%. That succeeds the United States, essentially. So what you have here is companies that are enormous now. So here's the big global fintech unicorn. Fintech means uh, worth over a, a billion dollars. Uh, Ant Financial, which is Alipay, has a $60 billion capitalization around it. Look at everything else. JD Finance is another Chinese company, $7 billion. SoFi, which we keep touting about here in the United States, $4 billion. Credit Karma, another well-known three and a half. Look how small these companies are in the United States compared to the two big companies that are in China. Enormous differences. And, and so China has sort of leapfrogged over a lot of this right now here. Two quick examples. Ant Financial, part of Alipay. Essentially, you do everything in one spot. One-stop financial wealth management. You want to buy a car? You want a home improvement loan? You do it, and you can do it inside the app. Apple made a big deal yesterday at its developers conference. And by the way, they had some great announcements in there. But the big deal they were talking about, one of them, was, OK, you're going to be an Apple messenger. You're now going to be able to go in and send money to somebody that you have, a Venmo kind of thing, essentially a competitor to Venmo. Well, everyone said, hey, this is great. <laughs> the Chinese have been doing this for years. You can go into WeChat here, the messaging app of Tencent, and you have been able to do this for years now. They've got one billion registered users. You can send money, you can borrow money within the app itself. It's already been existing for a while. And, and it's the single most used app in China. Think about that, 1.1 billion registered users, 365 million people in the United States. So just think about the implications here. There's a lot of numbers here, but I want to give you a sense of where the, in, the investor money is going. And this, this is venture capital money for 2015 and 2016. I want to just point out, last year we spent a lot of time talking about a lot of money going into lending, 58% uh, of the money. Uh, a lot of money going into payments, 11%. See this number here? 0% going into insurance. Look at 2016 where the venture capital, 34%. What happened? All of a sudden, the venture capital community, which is always chasing what's new, what's hot, and where they can get in immediately early and make the most money, suddenly woke up to what's going on in insurance. So the hot term in the last year that everyone has been talking about is insure tech here. This is the big theme. And there's some very simple things here, if you think about an insurance company, that make a lot of intuitive sense. So you have the internet of things here, and you're writing home insurance policies. You use the connected I'm being very simple here, smoke or water detectors to do better underwriting. There are companies out there that are now doing a lot of this. There are a couple of very simple ones. Cocoon is an internet-connected security devices for the home. They've been around. Roost is around. They do uh, enabled smart batteries for smoke and water detectors. There's a lot of these. And again, of course, based on a lot of data and information and, of course, giving up a lot of privacy at the same time. Auto and health, vehicle sensors to understand driving behavior are coming. My father got pitched by his insurance company. They would lower his insurance if they allowed them to monitor his driving behavior, including how often he brakes, for example. Uh, he didn't sign up for it, but it's an interesting idea. Uh, of course, wearable devices to improve insurance underwriting. FitSense is a company that enables health and life insurers to provide personalized products and services. So you get the idea here 
Uh, this is a very simple overview of where we can go with this. Now, obviously, the same problems exist with insurance as exist with the banking community. And that is, a lot of this stuff is very highly customized here. So the big issue is, how do you simplify the whole process of applying for a loan or applying for insurance? You ever fill out an insurance form? You ever fill out, like, you want to change your insurance company? It's a pain in the butt here. So if you can simplify the process from filling out forms to, to claim forms, that's an enormous advance to these companies. Digital is the big health here, help here, with health records, exercise habits, all of that, uh, and uh, auto records, and uh, the whole panoply of events is going to change things here. One company that might be worthwhile, if you ever want a, a good example of what they're doing here, uh, Oscar Health had a big raise last year. I, I think they raised $600 million in, in a venture around here. They're a real big leader in digital health insurance. I just put here booking doctor appointments. I know that's not terribly interesting, but they're really much more than that. They're one of the big leaders. If you're interested in finding out more, I would recommend checking them out. Clover Health is another one. They track inputs of personal medical history. They build profiles. They do this for customers who are trying desperately, like my personal care doctor in Philadelphia, who's now joined a new firm that's forcing him to digitize all of his records. How do you do that? They, they do that. There's other companies. There's lots of them out there, like Metro Mile. They offer pay-per-mile insurance to low-mileage drivers. And of course, you, you've got to allow them to basically uh, monitor you. But you get the idea here. The, the banks are already seeing dividends paid by already, I would call it relatively low-end uh, artificial intelligence. It's advanced compared to five years ago, but we're still in the infancy here. Facial and voice recognition has gotten much, much better. I don't know if you've called any banks recently, but they've gotten better. I know some people drive them crazy still, but the, the, we're getting much better on spending analytics and credit scoring and risk management now, uh, much better analysis. Um, the virtual agent technology has improved dramatically. You can do basic customer Q&A now. You, you can in, uh, in, enable a lot of transactions that you couldn't do even three or four years ago. And there, I know they're trying to automate the back office work. Uh, that's a little more tedious, but progress is being made year by year, not five years from now. It's happening and it's getting better every single year. I've done this similar lecture for the last four years, I think, and each year I hear improvements and the numbers are better. You all know about Watson here. Um, they're in the financial services area too, as well as the medical area, uh, looking for customer insights and risk and compliance is a major issue for them to help out here. Uh, and the question is, can they transform compliance and regulation? This is a very big issue for them. Bank branches is one of the comical things in the bank business. They've been talking about getting rid of bank branches for 20 years. And you know what's happened? It's essentially nothing. And it's, the reason is very interesting. In Europe, they're getting rid of bank branches. They've been declining 2% a year for a long time. And in Scandinavia, it's been even more so. Some parts of Scandinavia, uh, like um, Norway, they're down 35% in the last 10 years, bank branches. Some of them may be down even 40%. In the United States, it's been pretty steady, and the reason that's happened is the bank branches here have essentially transformed to focus on advisory and consulting services and not on transactions. So I've got a bank out there. I've got a bank right here uh, on Wall Street, and they open a new branch, and I walk in. I've had this banking relationship for 30 years. I go in, borrow, take out some money, and one day I had there's three people sitting there with a computer, and I had to go do something in a transaction I couldn't do in the machine, the teller machine, and I gave them my car, and they saw my profile. So now, I walk in, there's always somebody just sitting there, leaning there, like saying hello to everybody, like a greeter. Now they know me. Now, hello, how are you? Good to see you. Um, Mr. Pisani, isn't it? Yes. Okay, which is kind of creepy. I walk in, they know my name, but that's all right. So what can we do for you? I said, well, I'm just here to take out some money. Okay, anything else we can do for you? Good rates, would you like to talk to a service representative? They know my profile, basically. Uh, like a latte? Like anything else? Want to meet my girlfriend? Anything else? Every time I walk in, they're like ridiculously helpful and friendly to me. So that's the point here. Advisory and consulting services is what they're selling now when you go into these banks. And that's why the branches haven't dropped. But there's still a lot of effort to figure out a way to, to make the cost go down here. So 65% of the cost of the retail cost base in these banks is the bank branches themselves. So 
how quickly are customers going to be happy moving to digital? That's the overall question right now here. So reg tech is, the, is sort of the, the final key point here. These regulatory compliance issues, particularly since the financial crisis, are enormous. Here's the, one, the only two statistics you need to know about this. Bank headcount is down 10% in the last five years. 10% fewer employees work for banks in the last five years. The compliance headcount is up 100%. There's 10,000 people who work at Citigroup just in compliance. So consider, think about that. If you could find a way to simplify the existing process and reduce inputs, uh, automate regulatory reporting, that is an enormous win for these companies. That's where a lot of this is going here. So the question is, of course, the scalability, but security and data issues overall. Uh, that's the big, big barrier right now here. So the big overall theme here is how do you establish real trust and continue to have the trust so you can keep that relationship and expand on it. Uh, is it going to flatten out or is it going to expand more? And I think a lot of it's going to depend on that confidence factor, not just the convenience factor. We're already in the convenience factor, more confidence. So risk management's critical. Uh, obviously the fraud issue, we haven't had any enormous blow-ups where somebody's broken into Bank of America and everybody, we've had some small ones, but not enough to dramatically shake the confidence and the continuing convenience of using this. That's going to be a critical thing here. Um, you could talk about fintech and the consumer a little bit. Somebody once used the word, can we get a Fitbit for fintech here, where you essentially have um, a, a personal relationship where you can assemble data in one place and people are comfortable with the fact that that happens. I don't know. I think we're slowly making progress. The big thing is we haven't had any enormous uh, blow-ups here, here. So remember something, and I did this last year. Nobody's repealing the laws of gravity here. Uh, and we have not had a big economic downturn. Wait till you see what happens to some of these companies that are doing personal loans out there. These are not backed by anything. It's going to be an issue. They're not going to be exempt from the laws of gravity. Uh, fraud and data breach is the other major issue and the regulatory scrutiny. Now, whether this new regime in Washington, which promises less regulation, is really going to make a difference, I don't know. But uh, as of a year ago, it certainly did not. Finally, I just want to end. I'm, I'm a financial reporter. I'm not a futurist at all, but two years ago, I have a very intense interest in personal digital assistants. I find them absolutely amazing, despite my annoyance at Siri many times. I've played around with Amazon a lot, played around with Google Home, and I can tell you it's pretty amazing right now, particularly Amazon's Alexa, uh, what you can do and say to it and how it can respond to you. Uh, so two years ago, out of the blue while I was here, I made a prediction for not a lot of scientific basis at all. I said by 2024, 25% of the adult population will name a personal digital assistant as their best friend. I base this on two things. Number one, just looking at the technology and where it is going. It's not hard, just think about where the end game here is with this. And number two, looking at the fact that human beings tend to establish relationships with anyone who will give them some kind of emotional feedback, whether physical or simply verbal. And I used as my model for this the relationship that humans have with their pets. I don't know if any of you have ever looked at some of the surveys, the pet surveys that exist in the United States, but there are a lot of people who have very strange relationships with animals in the United States right now. So it, I, I, this is just one I pulled. I could pull out 100 of these things. So surveys of women pet owners. 13% of women pet owners would prefer a pet over a human if strand, stranded on a desert island. So if I'm stranded on a desert island, I want my cat, I don't want my husband or my boyfriend, basically. Uh, so what does this tell you? It tells you that people can have very intense relationships with non-human entities overall. So here's my point about this. Look at these numbers here. 35 million Americans are going to use a voice-activated digital assistance at least once a month this year. That's up 128% over 2016. Apple yesterday introduced a new speaker to go along with Siri. And of course, you have to distinguish a little bit between the physical speaker and the software that's going along with it. Amazon sells a speaker and the software that goes along with it, uh, comes along with it somewhat separately. Uh, but digital assistants themselves will grow 23% in 2017. So the bottom line is most people are going to have very, very intense relationships with these machines fairly quickly. We all saw the movie Her. I think that is a very accurate representation of exactly what's going to happen in the near future. It's going to be a very exciting conference. I'm very happy to be here. I'll be here uh, all night. Please come up and say hello to me. Thank you very much for having me tonight.